Hello, everyone. I believe we still have more people joining us, but we're going to go and get go ahead and get started. So hello, my name is Lisa Briseño. I'm a health communication specialist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm a dark haired woman wearing a dark blue shirt, and I have a white background. I'd like to welcome you to today's CDC Emergency Partners Information Connection, or EPIC, webinar. If this is your first webinar with us, we're so glad that you've joined us, and we invite you to learn more about CDC's emergency response communication activities, including past webinars and newsletters at our EPIC webpage, emergency.cdc.gov slash epic slash index and you'll also be able to find that url in the chat today's webinar will be recorded and posted to our website in the coming days if you do not wish for your participation to be recorded please exit at this time slides for the webinar are available on the webinar page which we're putting in the chat right now or you can type emergency.cdc.gov slash epic slash learn slash 2022 slash webinar 20221129.asp. Closed captions may be available for this webinar. Uh, we were having a little technical difficulty with them, but uh, you can, to view closed captions, please click on the more option, the three dots, and select show subtitle. Be aware that this option may be different depending on your device. We're also offering ASL or American Sign Language Interpretation which will be pinned on your screen to view throughout the webinar. Many respiratory viruses circulate year round in the United States with more activity in fall and winter. Right now, levels of respiratory syncytial virus, flu, and rhinovirus or enterovirus are higher than usual for this time of year, especially among children. COVID-19 also continues to circulate across the United States. This webinar will explain what CDC is seeing nationwide with these viruses and who's at higher risk for severe disease, as well as what people can do to protect themselves and other people around them, and how to treat the illness if you do get sick. Please note that we'll put links in the chat for your use. But to ask a question, please use the Q&A button. I'd like to apologize in advance that we may not get to all the questions, but we'll, we will do our best to answer as many as possible. And with that, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speakers. We will hear from Dr. Heidi Moline a pediatrician and medical epidemiologist in CDC's National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. She'll speak on RSV and COVID-19 today. That's respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, and COVID-19. She received her medical degree from the University of South Dakota and her master's in public health from Emory University. At CDC, she is the principal investigator for the new Vaccine Surveillance Network, which actively monitors viral respiratory diseases in children across seven U.S. pediatric hospitals. We'll also hear from Dr. Fatima Dawood, a medical epidemiologist with the CDC Influenza Division in the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. She will discuss influenza also known as the flu. Dr. Dawood received her under, undergraduate degree from Harvard University and her medical degree and training at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. At CDC, she's worked on analyses and studies in the United States, Thailand, India, and Central America 
focused on describing the burden of influenza, identifying risk factors for severe outcomes with influenza virus infection, and evaluating efficacy and effectiveness of influenza vaccine and antiviral medications, among other work. We have a lot of important information to get through, so let's get started. Dr. Dawood and Dr. Moline will alternately present on RSV, COVID, and influenza. Again, to ask a question, please use the Q&A button, and we will address the questions we've received after the presentations. Dr. Dawood and Dr. Moline, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to help you find me on the screen, I am the woman with the black hair and medium toned skin wearing a navy blue jacket. Um, as mentioned, I am a pediatrician and epidemiologist, and it is my great pleasure, along with Dr. Moline, to talk with you today about respiratory virus infections and what we can do to prevent ourselves and our loved ones and communities from becoming sick with respiratory virus infections this fall and winter season. As we just heard, there are many respiratory viruses that circulate year round in the United States, typically with more activity in the fall and winter. During the past two years, viral respiratory illness activity has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Circulation of other respiratory viruses besides SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, has often been atypical. As an example, flu circulation has been unusually low over the past two seasons, whereas flu typically causes a large portion of respiratory illnesses each fall and winter. Now, however, we are seeing a surge of non-SARS-CoV-2 respiratory viruses in the United States. At the same time, we anticipate that SARS-CoV-2 viruses may continue to circulate at high levels this fall and winter. Over the next few slides, we'll share with you information about circulation of specific respiratory viruses, starting with the flu. Next slide. Every year, CDC tracks flu activity in the United States using a number of monitoring systems or surveillance systems. What we've seen this year is that flu activity started early and is now elevated across the country. Flu hospitalization rates so far have been highest in older adults, 65 years of age and older, followed by young children, those less than five years of age. Among all ages combined, flu hospitalization rates at this point in the season are higher this year compared to the preceding uh, seasons going all the way back to 2010, 2011. Next slide. CDC uses data from the various monitoring and surveillance systems, as well as special analysis techniques to estimate the burden of flu illness each season in the United States. This season so far, preliminary estimates indicate there have been millions of illnesses and medical visits for flu already. There have been tens of thousands of hospitalizations and thousands of deaths. Thank you. To help you find me in the, in the screen, I am the woman with blonde hair wearing a black jacket in a white room. I'm Heidi Moline. I'm a pediatrician and a medical epidemiologist, and we'll be providing updates on RSV and COVID-19 throughout this talk. Typically, circulation of respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, starts in the fall and peaks in the winter. In most people, it causes a mild illness, but in, children, in young children and older adults, it can cause severe respiratory disease. This fall and winter, we have seen an increase in severe respiratory illness in children, which has strained pediatric hospital resources and bed, ava bed availability nationwide. The graph on the bottom right is from RSVNet's online interactive dashboard. This is a surveillance platform for RSV-associated hospitalizations in both children and adults. The current season is seen on the left side of the graph in green, and you can see 
that while RSV seasons typically peak from December to February, this year we are seeing an early season, we reaching a winter peak levels in October and November. We do see differences in RSV circulation by parts which part of the country we're in. RSV detections are actually beginning to decrease in the southeast and the south central parts of the country. And we are also seeing signs that the mid-Atlantic, the New England, and the Midwest regions may also be plateauing as well. As with past RSV seasons, children four years and un under, particularly those less than one year of age, are at highest risk of hospitalization. And this year, we are also seeing more older children hospitalized compared to previous, children, previous seasons. Next slide, please. So taking a step back, uh, what is RSV? RSV is a viral infection that causes um, the lung, that causes mucus to build up and causing babies to have difficulty breathing. It is the leading cause of hospitalization in the, in the United States among children less than one year of age. Most infants are infected in the first year of life and nearly all children have had RSV by age two. About 40% of infected infants will develop a lower respiratory tract infection called bronchiolitis, among whom about two to 3% of those will require hospitalization. And premature infants have hospitalization rates three times higher than those of infants bo born at full term. And while prematurity is a risk factor for hospitalizations, most babies who are hospitalized are healthy term babies. Next slide. So when we look at our surveillance data here, we see emergency department visits by age from our National Syndromic Surveillance Program, or NSSP. This surveillance includes about 75% of emergency departments across the country. With this graph, we are looking at visits to the emergency department by age for RSV and RSV-like illness, like bronchiolitis. We can see several seasonal waves here with the most recent wave on the far right. Right now, we see high rates of emergency department visits in all pediatric age groups, but particularly those less than one year. And you can see that trend is similar to the pre-pandemic winter peaks of RSV and an RSV-like illness that would typically occur in a winter month. Next slide. COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, remain important causes of acute respiratory illness, particularly among adults. This graph shows the number of cases per 100,000 since March of last year. Although COVID-19 is not currently driving hospitalizations among children, it does remain important an important cause of hospitalization among adults and will continue to monitor closely going into the winter months. Next slide, please. So overall, we continue to see an increase in severe respiratory disease and nationally, we are at a winter peak for a typical winter season. RSV may have peaked in some parts of the country, particularly the South and the Southeast, though it is still early and it is still increasing in other parts of the country. And early increases in seasonal influenza have been reported in most parts of the United States with the highest activity in the South Central and South Cent Southeast regions of the United States. Next slide, please. So for all, so let's, to talk a little bit about prevention, for all respiratory diseases, it's important to practice basic prevention measures, avoiding people who are sick. And if you can stay home, please try to stay home, cover coughs and sneezes, and also practicing good hand washing techniques. Those are all very important to help reduce the spread of disease. We also know that layering prevention strategies can help as well staying up to date on vaccinations, 
being mindful of indoor air ventilation and trying to increase indoor air ventilation, and wearing well-fitting masks can all help reduce the transmission of disease. Next slide, please. And preventing disease is important. And those, those basic uh, hygiene measures are key because th there is no vaccine currently available for, to prevent RSV. Although we have multiple products in late stages of development, right now, continuing to practice basic prevention measures is important for preventing RSV. Next slide. But we do have vaccines for COVID-19 and staying up to date is important to help prevent becoming sick, particularly for those with weakened immune systems. Preventing COVID-19 also means seeking treatment if you think you are sick and practicing the preventative actions we've mentioned earlier that also help prevent against RSV and influenza. Next slide, please. And briefly, the, the COVID-19 primary vaccination series is recommended for everyone six months of age and older. And the recommended vaccines include Moderna, Pfizer, and Novavax. Next slide, please. A bivalent booster dose is recommended for those over five years of age. The bivalent booster protects against both the original vaccine strain and the strain derived from uh, the Omicron variant. And monovalent uh, or, or the original strain vaccines are no longer authorized as, as booster doses. Next slide, please. We have room for improvement with our vaccine coverage for COVID-19 for booster doses, with just 11% of those eligible having received a bivalent booster. And while completion of the primary seasons series is high among older adults, COVID-19 vaccination among children remains low. Next slide. For influenza, we also know that the flu vaccine is the single best tool we have for preventing flu. It's important to, incur to get a flu vaccine for yourself and to encourage others in your community to get vaccinated this season. There are many scientific studies now that show that getting vaccinated with the flu vaccine reduces a person's risk of not only flu illnesses, but also flu hospitalizations, medical visits, life-threatening illness, and even flu-related death. For this season, it's also important to remember that you can receive a flu vaccine at the same time as receiving a COVID-19 vaccine, another important tool for preventing respiratory illness. Next slide. I'd like to briefly review with you who should get a flu vaccine. Annual flu vaccination is recommended for all people six months of age and older who do not have a contraindication in the vaccine. That's the majority of the US population. Now, although vaccination is recommended for all, there are certain groups for whom it's particularly important to get vaccinated because those groups are at higher risk for severe flu illness and flu complications. That includes children younger than five years of age, older adults 50 years of age and older, pregnant persons, and people with chronic medical conditions, for example, heart disease and diabetes. It also includes close contacts and caregivers of the groups that I just reviewed. Next slide. If you remember one thing about flu from today's talk, I hope you'll remember and share with others that there is still time to get a flu vaccine this season if you haven't gotten one or others in your community haven't gotten one yet. Every year, CDC monitors flu vaccination coverage. That is the number of people who get a flu vaccine. And what we're seeing this year is that flu coverage, flu vaccination coverage is lower for many groups at this point in the year compared to previous seasons. As an example, only one in three children this year has received a flu vaccine as of early November. Similarly, only one in three pregnant persons has received a flu vaccine this year so far. That's much lower than last season and even lower than the season before that. We also know many fewer doses of flu vaccine have been given to adults in general, doctors' offices, and pharmacies so far this year. These numbers tell us that we have more work to do 
to promote flu vaccination and help others understand the value of flu vaccine and its ability to reduce respiratory illness this season. Next slide. In this next section, we'll talk briefly about signs and symptoms of respiratory illness with various respiratory viruses. The first thing to know is there is a lot of overlap in symptoms between different respiratory virus infections. So it's not possible to distinguish different respiratory virus infections based on symptoms alone. And we'll talk more about the significance of that later. For flu, we know that it can cause mild illness all the way to severe illness, including illness that can lead to death. Flu symptoms often come on suddenly, and they can include symptoms such as fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose or stuffy nose, muscle aches, headaches, and fatigue. Some people also have vomiting and diarrhea when sick with the flu, though that tends to be more common in children than adults. Next slide. Children infected with RSV usually show symptoms within four to six days after getting infected. Symptoms of RSV infection usually include a runny nose, decreased appetite, coughing, sneezing, fever, and may include wheezing. In very young infants with RSV, sometimes the only symptoms may be irritability, decreased activity, or breathing difficulties. Next slide. For COVID-19, there are a wide range of symptoms and severity in both children and adults. The symptoms may, may include, uh, they may include symptoms from the list here, and it's important to recognize that these symptoms may change as new variants emerge. Importantly, older adults and those with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, lung disease, or diabetes are at higher risk for getting very sick from COVID-19 and may present with different symptoms. Next slide, please. If you or someone you know is showing any of these emergency signs for COVID-19, please call 911. This includes trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, an inability to stay awake, or discoloration of the skin. Again, these warning signs may present differently in different populations, but it is important to seek care when you need it. Next slide. With all respiratory viruses, children can become very sick very quickly. So it's important to watch for these warning size, signs. Fast breathing, working hard to breathe, dehydration, and, and increased fussiness are all concerning signs that may require medical care. Next slide, please. In adults, emergency warning signs include difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, persistent pain or pressure in the chest or abdomen, dizziness, confusion, difficulty waking up or rousing. They can also include seizures, not urinating, severe muscle pain, severe weakness or unsteadiness, or a fever or cough that improved but then came back and worsened. People with any of these signs or symptoms should seek medical attention right away. At the same time, it's important to know that the, this list is not all inclusive. So if you are sick with respiratory illness and you have symptoms that are severe or concerning to you, it's important to consult with your medical provider. Next slide. When is testing for respiratory viruses needed? This is a common question. As we talked about earlier, it's not possible to tell the difference between different respiratory virus infections based only on symptoms because there is a lot of overlap in the symptoms caused by each virus. The first thing to know is to talk with your health care professional about whether testing is needed if you're sick with respiratory illness and unsure. Testing can help to identify the illness and confirm a diagnosis. This can be particularly important in certain situations. For example, identifying the illness is important for people at increased risk of severe illness and people who are very sick, for example, hospitalized with illness. The reason for this is that there are treatment options available for some respiratory infections, such as flu and COVID-19. Next slide. So now we'll talk about the various treatment options that are available, starting with influenza or flu. 
If you get sick with flu, flu antiviral drugs may be a treatment option, and there are now several flu antiviral medications available for adults and children. All of these antiviral medications work best when they're given early, ideally within a day or two of symptoms starting, though there can be benefit from treatment even later for certain populations. CDC recommends prompt treatment with influenza antiviral medications for people who are in groups that are at higher risk for severe influenza and influenza complications, as well as for people who are very sick, for example, hospitalized with illness. If you are in a group that is at higher risk for severe flu and you develop flu symptoms, it's best to talk with your doctor early and remind them of the high risk conditions that you have to determine whether treatment may be right for you. Next slide. For RSV treatment and care, there is no specific treatment for RSV infection, though most RSV infections improve on their own in about a week or two. If a child is sick, please take steps to relieve symptoms by managing fever and pain with over-the-counter fever reducers and pain relievers, dr drinking enough fluids, and talking to your healthcare provider before giving your child a non-prescription cold medication. Again, call a healthcare professional if you or your child is having difficulty breathing, not drinking enough fluids, or experiencing worsening symptoms. Next slide, please. If you test positive for COVID-19 and are more likely to get very sick, treatments are available that can reduce your chances of hospitalization and death. We have antivirals and monoclonal antibodies for COVID-19, which work best if treatment is started early. Other medications can help reduce symptoms and help manage your illness as well. Next slide, please. In this last section, Dr. Moline and I would like to share resources that are available for you to be able to share the information you heard about today with your families, your communities, and your colleagues. For flu, CDC encourages all of its partners to continue to promote the importance of vaccination, especially over the next few weeks, given the early flu activity and lower flu vaccination coverage rates that we are seeing right now. CDC has a digital media toolkit that is available on our website which includes social media messages, print-ready materials, videos, and more that can be used to promote and educate about flu vaccination. Next slide. For RSV, CDC again encourages all partners to continue to promote the importance of RSV prevention and again, the basic hygiene practices. Over the next few weeks, given the increased activity and approaching holiday season, this is especially important. Our CDC resources will be available uh, on, in the chat um, and again has print ready materials for, for your use. Next slide, please. Similar resources are available for COVID-19 and particularly for those um, looking for booster recommendations and timing of the bivalent booster uh, administration our online web, sort of web resources uh, are available with print ready materials, videos, and more that can be used to promote COVID-19 vaccination and prevention. Next slide, please. So we are happy to answer questions. Um, we also have, uh, I believe the next couple of slides are, are data slides. I think with that, I'll hand it over to the EPIC team for, for any, uh, Further slides. Thank you both very much. And we can tell this is a very popular topic, or these are very popular topics, because we have quite a few questions. I will go ahead and start with one of the ones that we've received already. That is, when children contract RSV, what medications can be used to alleviate symptoms when coughing is prevalent? Also, when a cough lingers, how do parents and caregivers know when it is bad enough to be hospitalized? And Dr. Moline, I believe that would be a question for you. Yeah, thank you for the question. 
so it's important with uh, with children to avoid co cold medications in especially young infants. And, and it can be hard as a parent to see a child coughing, um, coughing intensely. Um, oftentimes providing a, an environment where the child can breathe in cool air can help help with the with a cough. Um, but you don't want to do what you would do with adults and we don't want to give honey. You really just are trying to provide supportive care, keeping a child well hydrated. Um, and even if they're not taking as much uh, fluid as they normally would, not bottling as well or breastfeeding as well, to, to keep an eye on wet diapers, making sure that, um, that they are staying hydrated uh, because fever and cough um, can are, are really demanding on a, on a young body. So um, those those are kind of the the really what we're trying to do with um, with cough and and supportive care for kids with RSV is is to get them through the hurdle of the five to seven day peak and um, hopefully they improve shortly after. Thank you. And again, before we proceed with the questions, I do want to remind everyone that we may not get to all of the questions. So please accept our apologies, but we will do our best to get to as many as we can. With that, our next question, and again for Dr. Moline, what is the primary reason or reasons for the explosive growth of RSV infections so early in the respiratory virus season? Yeah, thank you. So we did not see a significant amount of RSV um, in 2020 and 2021 winter season when we would typically see RSV. Um, in, in 2021, last August to November or so, we actually did have an RSV season. It was a little wider, so less extreme in, in a peak, um, but we did see RSV in, in kids last, last season. This year, it's really, um, there are multiple viruses circulating at the same time. Um, and I think there's, it, we're still learning about, uh, about why that is. I think uh, it's important to recognize a virus that was mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, rhinovirus and enteroviruses. Um, uh, many of the older children with RSV this year have co-infections and some of those co-infections are, are with rhinoviruses and enteroviruses. And so it's there are multiple viruses circulating, and um, you know, recognizing that we still have a lot to learn, but also uh, that the season does seem to have uh, a higher amount of older children affected by RSV as well than we would typically see. Thank you. Do we know why that is? Why we're seeing older children? Why we're seeing more older children? Right. So I. <laughs> So I think part of it is because we did have a kind of a wider season last season. So some children that may have been affected um, in in a typical intense RSV season um, were, were, were kind of spared last year. And so now we're seeing a little bit of that now, but also playing into this, the multiple viruses circulating. So um, many of the older children we're seeing with RSV are presenting with more uh, asthma-like symptoms, and, and those are often seen um, with rhinoviruses and enteroviruses, the co-infections that are happening alongside RSV in, the, in those older children. Thank you. Our next question is for both of our presenters. What are the risks of going to large events right now, even if we wear masks? Is there any guidance? Perhaps I can start and Dr. Moline may want to add as well. Um, I think we know that being in large crowded environments, especially indoors, can potentially increase exposure to respiratory viruses. Um, and so I think what's really important to remember actually is the tools we can take and use to prevent respiratory illness. So as Dr. Moline described earlier, everyday preventive actions trying to stay away from people that we know are ill. If you yourself are come down with illness, not going into crowded public places if possible, um, covering your cough and sneeze, washing your hands, those sort of old fashioned tools that we know work well, um, staying up to date on your vaccines. And again, um, guide, there is guidance to consider using a well-fitted mask, um, particularly in large public crowded settings when we know there's elevated respiratory virus circulation. 
Dr. Moline, is there anything I might have missed or that you'd like to add? No, I, I agree. And I, I think the only thing I will add is, is that particularly for young infants, um, this, this may be a time of year where, where we're especially careful about the, the groups and gatherings um, that a brand new baby will, will be exposed to. So if people are, are sick um, at a large gathering, you know, to, to, to make sure that you are doing those preventative measures to protect um, the ones that are most at risk at, at RS, of RSV, which, which again are, are those young infants, um, particularly those less than two, two months. Thank you both. Our next question is for Dr. Dawood. Uh, if my child already had the flu, should I take him to get the flu vaccine? The short answer is yes. Um, there are different types of flu viruses that circulate. The flu vaccines that are available protect against four different strains every season. So even if you think or know that your child has had flu in the past, in the last couple of weeks or the past couple of months, it's still worthwhile to go out and get a flu vaccine so that your child is protected against other circulating viruses. Thank you very much. And while we're on the topic, Dr. Moline, per perhaps you could answer the same question about COVID-19. How soon after a COVID-19 infection said, should somebody get their next dose of COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, I think um, it, what's important is the, the which dose it is. And, and our dosing schedule is a little complicated to get into here, but I think our online website uh, has resources for the correct schedule following um, following an, an acute infection or asymptomatic infection um, for when vaccine dosing would be appropriate, depending on the dose. Thank you. And we have some questions regarding daycare. I'll start with, when is it recommended that a child return to care after an RSV diagnosis? We've had many different answers from providers in our area. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be entirely honest. I, I, I am not actually sure that we have specific guides, guidelines on that um, because it is so uh, dependent on in, in specific daycare settings. Um, and so I think health, health departments might, might have different guidelines as well. Um, I think it's always important that your child does not have a fever when going back to daycare. So making sure they're 24 hours without fever. Uh, but I would defer to the... Um, to, Specific daycares may have may have different guidelines uh, for for returning after RSV. A child can have a cough for a while, even if they're not infectious, and so I think that's one of the challenges and why those there may be different um, guidelines for for post infection return to daycare. Thank you. And if I heard correctly, then it sounds like uh, the short answer to that question would be to follow the advice of the local health authorities, such as the health department. Yeah, I would check with your local health department. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and our next question related to daycare is, as a daycare worker, how do we decide who to exclude or send home? I can, I can start, but then I'll, I'll toss it over to the other pediatrician on the call too. Um, you know, the, again, this kind of falls to a similar answer of it, it depends. And so making sure that a child does not have a fever when they return to, to daycare is important. Also, they, if they do have a fever, you know, making sure that they go home. So I think having um, fever-based and illness-based uh, guidelines uh, may be different depending on where you're at. But that kind of fever rule, for me at least, is, is kind of um, what I always recommend as a pediatrician. Thank you, Dr. Dawood. Would you like to add to that? I think Dr. Moline covered the key points really well, so I don't have anything to add, but I think again, similar to the previous question, consulting with your local guidelines and in your local health department can be helpful as well. Thank you. And I believe this question is for Dr. Moline. What is the anticipated timeline for FDA and CDC to authorize bivalent boosters for children under five years of age? Yeah, that, that's a, it's a good question. And um, I think one that we're interested here in, here at CDC, I think the timeline is still unclear. 
um, but we do hope to be able to move forward with those recommendations, um, hopefully in the in the near future. Thank you. Next question is for both of our presenters. Do you expect there to be serious issues with flu or RSV in congregate living situations such as prisons? Perhaps I can start. And again, Dr. Moline may want to add, I think with all respiratory viruses, it's difficult to predict what we'll see in the future with activity. But I think from what we've shared today, we are seeing elevated activity across the country for a number of viruses, including flu, for example. And so with that comes increased risk in many different settings, including congregate settings. Um, so I think, again, um, it's important for us to use the tools we have to prevent illness where we can. And that comes back again to the things we were talking about earlier. Vaccines for the viruses for which vaccine is available, flu vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, taking everyday preventive measures, and in some certain um, cir circumstances, mask use as well. I don't have anything to add. I think that's appropriate. And that certainly is what we see in RSV and COVID as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Our next question is actually related to masks as well. It reads, in general, masks are no longer mandated. What is the recommendation for wearing a mask when you are out in public since we're in a season for increased respiratory viruses? And if either of our presenters could answer that, we would appreciate it. I guess I can start. I think um, we do know that during times of high respiratory virus circulation, masks can help prevent um, the spread and, and transmission of, of viruses. Um, and so that is kind of just a broad blanket statement for, for we the fact that we do know that and, and that can help as well. Um, I don't know if on the influenza side, you, you want to add anything else for that? I think in, in, I don't really have anything else to add, but um, perhaps we could drop into the chat the link to CDC's mask guidance, um, which I think provides more detail and may help answer follow-up questions about mask use. Thank you. Yes, we will drop that in the chat. Um, we have a, uh, discussed a similar question earlier on, but this one has a slightly different take. Um, let me scroll back to it. Uh, how, how soon should someone wait to get the influenza vaccine after being exposed to influenza? Dr. Dawood, could you answer that, please? So there is no specified period. If you've been exposed or around somebody that you think or you know has the flu, um, there is no waiting period to get the vaccine. Sooner is always better. You know, once you get the vaccine, it takes some time for your body to um, build the protection that's needed um, to protect you against the flu. So sooner is always better. Thank you. Dr. Moline, this one is for you. Has there been any additional data showing the relationship between RSV and asthma, if one is causation for the other or how they may be related? Or do we tend to see more severe RSV in asthmatics? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, most RSV that causes hospitalizations and ED visits are in young children, you know, younger than six months that, that are not presenting in an asthma-like picture. We do know that RSV can cause wheezing, just like many respiratory viruses can cause wheezing. But compared to like a rhinovirus and an RSV, we see more wheezing-associated asthma-like picture with a rhinovirus and enteroviruses. Um, I think now that we're seeing a slightly older group of children with RSV, we might be able to, to dig into that a little more. Um, and I think that as we, as we move forward, we're learning from this group of children with co-infections to be able to kind of com compare the difference too. Thank you. This next question is for both of our presenters. Um, Dr. Dawood, maybe you'd like to go first. Can you give any recommendations regarding antivirals for individuals under 18 years old? Well, I'll, I'll start by speaking from the flu perspective, specifically about flu antiviral medications. Um, there are several antiviral medications that are available for use in both children and adults. 
including one antiviral medication that can be used all the way down to day, days old infants, so young, young children. Um, and so I think the important things to remember are that if you think that you may benefit from antiviral treatment for flu, talk with your healthcare provider sooner rather than later. Um, CDC's recommendations for flu antiviral medication treatment are we specifically recommend it for people who are at higher risk of severe flu complications, as well as for people who are very sick. Um, for example, they are hospitalized with severe illness that could be from flu. Um, so again, if you are in one of those groups, talk with your healthcare provider about whether um, flu antiviral medication may be the right option for you. Thank you. And Dr. Moline, would you like to speak to COVID-19 vaccination or antivirals? Yeah, so on, on the pediatric side, the, the data are limited um, for product use, but I believe rem, remdesivir is available um, as a monoclonal therapy for, for children with, uh, so it's not an antiviral, but it is, but it is available for children um, with uh, moderate to severe uh, COVID-19. Thank you. And uh how do you get the antiviral when you may not know for a few days that you have it? And then you have to go to the doctor. Um, I, I don't believe that's necessarily a rhetorical question, but I would like to give you the opportunity, if you would please, to let us know if someone suspects they may have a virus for which antivirals could be helpful, how would you recommend they proceed? Well, I think one of the important aspects, and I'll, I guess I'll dive in on this first, but um, one of the important aspects of where we're at right now is if you have a respiratory disease, you may not know what it is right now. It, it, flu is looking like, you know, flu and COVID and RSV, it, you know, it, it's hard to know. So I think it's important to talk to your doctor early and, and, and get testing. And this is why testing is really important right now particularly for antivirals that can keep you out of the hospital. Um, but you won't know unless you, unless you do get testing. So in, engaging with your healthcare providers early is an important first step to, to testing and, and, um, and getting access to those treatments. Thank you. Dr. Dawood, would you like to add? Sure. Uh, the only thing I would add is uh, just a reminder and um, information that influenza antiviral medications are available by prescription only. And so again, as Dr. Moline pointed out, it's important to talk with your healthcare professional early um, to figure out whether treatment is right for you um, and, and then get a prescription from there. All right, so if I'm imagining myself and maybe I'm feeling like perhaps I'm starting to get sick, do I call the doctor at that point? Do I wait and see if I genuinely feel feverish or have a sore throat, uh, I'm coughing and sneezing? Um, you know, if, I, if you put yourself, I, I'm trying to put myself in the position of somebody trying to make that decision and just figure out is there best advice or just call the doc as soon as you think you might be sick. Like I think, for, yeah, for COVID-19, you know, it's, it's important to recognize that everybody has a different risk profile. And so some people, those who do fall within a high risk of having a high risk of complication, you know, they're going to have a much lower threshold to talk to your doctor um, to get access to those medications. Thank you. Uh, next question for Dr. Moline. Do children develop immunity to RSV? Yeah, so RSV is, is one of those viruses where we develop immunity for a, for a few months, and typically it lasts throughout the season. So it's rare, but some children can get RSV twice a season. Um, if you have it very early in the season, you, can, you may get it if it's still circulating three or four months later. But most children will get it once and then have immunity that lasts throughout the season. But, um, but even adults get RSV. It's just pre presents as a very mild illness, as a cough or a cold. Thank you. And we have uh, someone asking for clarification on an earlier question. They ask, uh, my understanding is that influenza remains a clinical diagnosis. Has CDC changed position on this? Is CDC recommending testing prior to Tamiflu use? 
Dr. Daywood. So um, I think I'll address the last part of that question first. Um, because we know that influenza antiviral medications work best when they're given early, um, the recommendation, especially for people who are at higher risk for severe flu or flu-related complications, or who are very sick with flu, again, such as being hospitalized, is for early empiric treatment. Empiric meaning testing is not required to start treatment. However, I think in the context of this current season, where there are many different viruses circulating, testing can be an adjunct, it can be helpful. Um, and so it may be that um, your healthcare professional starts antiviral treatment, but also thinks that testing could be helpful to distinguish your illness, um, you know, whether you have flu or COVID or another respiratory virus. Um, and that can be helpful for both treatment decisions as well as other management decisions. Um, so I think to come back to the viewer's question, testing is not required to start flu antiviral treatment, but it can be helpful um, sometimes to make other management and treatment decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question for Dr. Moline, do we have a greater ability to detect RSV now as compared to prior years? Has this changed the health community's awareness or reporting of RSV? You know, I think that's a great question, and, and I work in RSV surveillance, and so we're, we're often wondering, you know, are we really seeing more or are we testing more? Um, and I think it's a little bit of both. And so right now we are doing, there is just broadly more testing for RSV than five years ago, um, not just in kids, but also in adults as well. And so the testing piece, whether you're, you know, at an urgent care or you're in the hospital, um, those those have shifted a bit to where we are just having, um, a, we're more likely to be testing for RSV now than we were in the past. Um, that being said, we are seeing more virus as well this year. Thank you. And we may have time for just one more question. This one's also going to be about COVID-19. Dr. Moline, can you please discuss the research or data regarding immune damage caused by COVID-19 infections and how that is infecting new infections? I don't know that I entirely understand the question. Thank you. Uh, I believe the person who wrote the question understands uh, that there may be effects on the immune system from having had COVID-19. Is that the case? Yeah, well, we know that viral infections, whether it's RSV or influenza or rhinovirus or COVID, um, it, it causes an immune response and antibodies are produced. And, and as part of that, the, the immune system reacts. And, and so I think regardless of the virus, we, we know that happens. So I, I think beyond that is probably beyond of what I can speak to in for, for COVID, but um, I think uh, we do know infections lead to an immune response. Thanks. All right, thank you. And I do have one more question that I would like to ask because I think it's going to be relevant to a lot of people. And this is for both of our presenters. Do you have any advice for those who rely on public transit or ride sharing to get to and from work and I assume other places? Is masking the most effective way to prevent the spread or is there something else which can be done on buses, trains, et cetera? I think going back to, to some of those, um, or those broad prevention methods, thinking about um, air circulation, right? So opening windows where we can um, at, at a public health level and in our communities, just being mindful of what the level of respiratory viral circulation is can help guide some of those decisions. But, you know, when, when necessary, covering coughs, washing hands um, and, and opening windows can all help reduce the transmission of, of viruses. Thank you. And I will add uh, to that, that if you'd like to see the difference that improving air circulation can make in uh, a building, CDC does have tools regarding that on its website. Um, well, I think that is all the time we have for questions, unless Dr. Dawu, you would like to add anything to Dr. Moline's answer. Thank you, but I don't have anything additional to add. Well, thank you both so much.
See, to learn more about EPIC, RSV, COVID-19, or the flu, you can visit CDC web pages for each of these. And we'll be putting those in the chat. They're also available in the slide deck that you can find on the EPIC webinar page. I want to thank everyone for attending and thank you for your attention to these topics. When we have more information, we can all work together to keep our communities safer and healthier. If you have any additional questions, please email us at epic, that's E-P-I-C, at cdc.gov, and we will route your question to the appropriate expert. Slides are available for this webinar on the webinar page. And to learn more about CDC's emergency re response communication activities, including past webinars and newsletters, you can visit our EPIC page. You can find the recording of this webinar on CDC's uh, on EPIC's webinar page and YouTube in approximately eight to 10 days. Thank you so much for your time and for all the wonderful questions. Happy holidays from your CDC EPIC team and have a wonderful day.